I have my speaker off. Sorry, Sue's talking to herself. <laughs> <laughs> she never seen an H.W. Bush stamp before. I thought it was cute. All right, we are live. Uh, so I'll make a motion to come out of executive session. I'll second. Roll call, Amy. Kathleen. Yes. Vicki. Yes. Sabrina. Yes. Is there action? No action. Okay. So we are to your discussion items. Yes. So um, I present to you the March, April data report. Um, what I've seen as um, changes on um, page one relevant to public assistance, public welfare benefits, benefits um, have stayed pretty stable with the exception of an increase in Medicaid. Um, definitely saw an increase because of the loss of employment as a result of COVID-19. So you're gonna see that. Um, you're also seeing a significant increase in food stamps for individuals of about 1,600 more. Again, more people applying for public welfare because of loss of employment. Um, child care reduced because the centers were closed for a period of time. So that would also be a result of COVID-19. Um, and so those are the stable and significant changes on page one regarding public assistance. Um, page two, under the customer service center in the public assistance lobby here in the admin building on the second floor, you see, of course, zero client scene because our lobby was closed in the month of April as a result of COVID-19. Um, and you also uh, saw, we saw a reduction in calls. Um, I also think that has to do with how expedient my team has been with processing applications. That is coupled with the state allowing us to not take any negative action on cases, closing cases, sanctioning cases. So their focus was processing applications as soon as they came in the door. So, um, you know, as a result, we saw less consumers calling and following up on benefits because we were more expedient than we had been prior to COVID-19. So that's a positive. Um, so that really, unless you have any um, questions on page two, um, of course, our net transportation reduced as a result. Um, we did still provide transportation through Emerald and PARTA to the essential medical services for dialysis patients, um, those um, in substance abuse, substance abuse treatment, but some other routine trips we saw reduction in April again as a result of COVID-19. Moving on to page, uh-huh. Oh, go ahead. Are you, I had a question on page four. Okay, I'm moving on to page three. Um, I'll, okay. Three, um, the significant change on page three is total services provided to our Ohio Means Job Center customers. You see an increase of about 700 more um, services. We did phenomenal in our outreach virtually to customers. We got permission from the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services Unemployment Office um, to be able to create a video. We helped out with a lot of those questions. So virtually um, that team did a significant, uh, excellent and provided significant work um, virtually for people that were underemployed and unemployed. So um, that's the increase that you see there. Um, page How are you four. Doing on, on that page, on page three, which of the numbers, is there a number that indicates that a person has gotten a job through no. our services? No, that's, well, they're actually, the state has a new vendor that's going to upgrade the Ohio, what's the CMS stand for, Sue? OWCMS. OWCMS, it's an acronym, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Case management. Case system. management. But the system does not have a filter to track those that get employment. Um, hopefully with the new system and the new vendor, we'll be able to do that. But um, okay. 
there is not a tracking mechanism right now in the state system that gives us that data. Okay. Page four is the impact program that replaced the passages program where we're trying to work with obligors through child support to get training and employment. Um, those numbers are pretty small or minimal, but I can report to you in a team meeting that I had that there were 17 referrals made to that program this month. So we're hoping to see a significant uh, increase and in change with that population as well. Work experience program, those are participants that have to participate in some kind of job capacity as a requirement of the state of Ohio. And so it's just um, giving you placement numbers relevant to those participants on public welfare. And I'm on page five. I did not see anything significant as far as change there, unless you had any questions. Mandy collects a lot of data. And then page six under children's services, um, we had uh, zero adoptions finalized, and but we have a couple of children that are in the legal process of being adopted. So you'll hear about that in the future. And then children in custody at the end of April, we had 219. Um, to date, we have 201. So the report doesn't reflect the re reflect the reduction. Um, we attribute that reduction to schools being out earlier and us not having the reports coming in through the abuse neglect hotline as we had in the past. So we absolutely believe that children are still being abused and neglected. And we're just not seeing the amount of referrals that we had in the past. So again, unfortunately, and fortunately, it's a double-edged sword. Um, for us, we're not learning about all of it from a system and a financial standpoint. It's allowed us to see a reduction in numbers. So 201 as of um, this month. So basically what you're saying is that number is deceiving, correct? It's, it's sad. We're saving money because we have less kids in care, but we are also seeing a reduced number of referrals because the schools were out early and that's a predominant reporting source for us. Right. So the sad part is abuse and neglect didn't stop and our momentum hasn't changed because we're doing anything different. Right. It's really because, you know, the county stopped, the state stopped for two and a half months and kids stayed home with families and neighbors didn't get to see kids a lot and teachers weren't seeing kids a lot. And so not just Portage County, the other 87 counties and directors meetings were all bracing ourselves that what could potentially happen in the fall on all levels but again if this and, and we're hopeful that the schools open in some capacity but um that could also open the floodgates for child welfare because these kids haven't been seen for months so um more to come on that but that's been a concern expressed from the jfs directors to the state jfs director yeah. um definitely there's no more resources coming down to the down the chain and channel so um, we're just going to take it day by day and see what happens. And I'll keep you abreast of those changes too. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, child support numbers pretty consistent. And um, our staffing numbers are a little about, it says 201 as of the end of April. We had a couple of resignations to which we're not filling. So it's about 198 staff at this point on page seven. And that's all I had to report unless you had questions on the data report. No questions? No. Good, okay. Then I, I typed you a memo uh, on JFS operations, outreach and training as a result of COVID-19. So we've been very successful in the telework world. Um, we do virtual meetings every other Wednesday. Um, one Wednesday, I think the odd number of months, the admins report out, administrators report out to the supervisors. And then the following month, the 35 supervisors do report outs. And we recorded a DVD for all of you. Um, if you're, not that you have downtime, but um, the supervisors are reporting excellent work from staff, from quantity and quality. 
the vast majority love telework. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you and I'll, I'll filter that DVD up if you, if you have time to look at that, that would be great. Um, I do know from association meetings, JFS association meetings that um, the state is looking at the options for us to be able to continue in some form telework in the future. They're seeing excellent numbers, especially in the public welfare world. Um, case in point in Portage, we were very um, delinquent on Medicaid renewals just because of the um, onset of Affordable Care Act and having thousands more people on Medicaid. And we're gonna be at a place first time in three years, we're gonna be caught up at the end of this month. And so again, on the state side, when they're looking at our production and our numbers, they are seeing a lot of positive wow. in a lot of our, our world. So a more to come from me to you when they talk more to us about those options. But I can tell you the team here, 95% would love some hybrid um, future in the telework world. So um, again, more to come. But so this talks about that. Um, but as we shut down the lobbies, rightfully so, because of the pandemic. But with the unemployment rate as it is, and even though we're doing exceptional virtually, um, most of the counties have been opening their Ohio Means Job Centers over the last month, month and a half. And so we want to follow suit and open our Ohio Means Job Center on June 22nd. Um, we, I attached a guideline, a safety guideline that the staff developed. We um, used uh, the CDC guidelines to develop that. We've conferred with Bob Walker from Portage County Health District. Um, we are part of the EMA discussions weekly. So we've kept them all abreast of this piece too. Um, but we do need to provide um, an open door type of service for the unemployed um, more than just virtually. So we like to open June 22nd June 29th, I'm sorry, we ordered plexiglass and we heard this week it wasn't going to come in in time. So so that date says June 22nd, but we're proposing and you'll have a press release come your way in the next day or so of opening June 29th. Um, the hours would be limited. The press release reveals that. I think it's 9 to 11 and then 1 to 3 um, so that we can sanitize between not allowing any more than 10 people in our Ohio Means Job Center at one time. Um, definitely following safety protocol, taking temperatures, making masks available. While we know under the governor's order, we can't mandate people to wear masks, we can recommend, and the EMA has given us a great supply to be able to offer our customers masks. Um, also, if the other lobbies in the buildings, if the other county buildings aren't opening in the near future, we can also use the Ohio Means Job Center to see clients on an emergency basis from the other four, the other three divisions. So children's services, child support, um, and public assistance, um, there'll be enough office space available there if we have to do emergency one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -face visits. So I'm hoping that you all support that opening on June 29th. Um, the guidelines are attached so you can see what precautions we're gonna take. Um, mm -hmm. All about 95 of our staff um, have completed training with Bob Walker through the Portage County Health District and the remainder 105 are scheduled in the month of July. So any of the staff that are going to be working out of the Ohio Means Job Center and it's going to be about 10, not the full staff, have already received full training on safety. And so I just wanted to make you aware of that, see if you had any questions and also ask your support in reopening on June 29th. Well, Kelly Joe, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially in light of, of the unemployment situation right. and, and the ability of, of your staff to help assist our residents in their time of need. Uh, one, one point you made um, about um, different safety standards in place, we actually could uh, require masks. That's up to individual employers uh, and individual businesses and entities if they want to do that. The governor did not require it, but a business or a public entity can. And I know we have that in some, like the courthouse, for example, 
yeah. uh, there are requirements. So it, you know, I think you should think about that and especially maybe talk to your staff that you know are gonna be on site. I think that would be a good recommendation uh, to require it to keep them safe and uh, members of the public safe. Um, the sign, the so signage, just, yeah, the signage we developed um, does say that we recommended it. Um, again, I was made to believe in in one of the EMA meetings that we couldn't require it. So we put the signage that we strongly recommend it. Um, but if you say that we can research more, if we can require it, I'd love to require it. I was just kind of told we weren't allowed to. So I, I got to can require message. it. You can, okay. You can require it. You're not okay. for like, we're required to have our staff and then right. it's up to us whether we want to require the public. So you can require the public. I then I will it, just change, that... I'll change the verbiage on the sign because for safety measures, we would prefer to require it. Yeah, and let's hold for a moment because it looks like we lost Sabrina. Oh, okay. She may have had a connection issue. Okay, she's back. We can keep going. I'm good. Okay. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. okay. Jane, Commissioner, did you have a question? I just want to ask Jane, does this come into play when you said we have to document if they can't wear masks for some reason? Would this be applied to like JFS also? I think that I was going to talk to her specifically, but okay. when they come back in our building, they have to wear it. They'd have to wear it at any location. Okay. It's the employer's obligation to make sure their employees wear a mask at work. And I agree with Kathleen and I'll, I'll dig the language out. It was in one of the Ohio Department of Health communiques that the individual business can require a visitor in their business to do a temperature check, mm -hmm. a self-evaluation, answer the questionnaire and wear a mask. So and the only we thing have it was if he was close. And we have all those except for again the language we had was recommended because again we so we absolutely if you can find the language just so we have awesome. my management team that would be great and it, it would be as simple as changing a couple words on some flyers. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. And then the middle section of that memo talks about uh, my decision to cancel some events um, again as a result of um, the current pandemic. So our senior forum would have been um, this fall and we you have a press release coming your way that we're going to move it to 2021. Um, you'll see future press releases on the other events, the fatherhood celebration, um, the child support appreciation lunch and the back to school health and wellness fair. We're really sad because we have nine teenagers in foster care graduating from high school this year. And so we all usually, um, I know Commissioner Bennett, you were able to attend last year. We, we give them an actual graduation party. So mm -hmm. pretty sad we're not able to offer that, but we're still providing them with, um, you know, our routine stipends and congratulatory um, outreach. Um, it's just really sad. It's really nice too that the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services has solicited information from all 88 counties on our graduates and the state is also going to provide a gift to all of the youth and foster care who are graduating again recognizing this is a sensitive time for kids that had you know dreams to walk down or walk across that stage and so um but anyways that's sad but we're also going to make sure it counts for them and and it's really exciting to have nine of our kiddos graduating this year hey, Kelly um, Joe. Uh -huh. Kelly Joe. yes remember seeing something where they passed legislation where the children in foster care during this pandemic just because they age out doesn't mean they immediately get get kicked out of foster care correct um if okay. if there's a, a issue or a challenge with placement or emancipation into a different um that the state will provide us with um, funds to be able to maintain them in current placements. So that's, yes, that's absolutely correct. 
the fortune in our in our county we didn't have that need but it was really great to know that the state recognized that and was you know willing to support that so that's great um all of our associations to which we belong to four um, has decided not to hold fall conferences training conferences of course um, because of the pandemic so um, we are not participating in any training or fall conferences with our um, state associations this fall. So I wanted to make you aware of that. Um, and then following suit with the county, um, we had already imposed the hiring freeze in children's services because of the residential placement crisis, so on and so forth. But um, I did speak to my management team this week and inform them that that hiring freeze will follow all of our divisions effective immediately. Um, so that mm -hmm. speaks to that. And then, um, you know, again, I'll send out an email to all staff today. Unfortunately, I'm out next week for medical and I give them weekly updates. So I'll speak to that hiring freeze in today's email. Um, and then as we continue to amend operations and, and changes, um, I'll make sure that you're aware of them, but you do have about four or five, uh, two press releases and a couple of flyers coming your way on some of these things that I just discussed. Not on this memo, but I did want to also tell you that um, every year we provide back to school vouchers for kids, for families. Yeah, um, yeah. We have historically provided $100 um, vouchers for families that are on um, food assistance and $75 vouchers for families that are on Ohio Works First cash assistance. This year, we decided to offer all families a $75 voucher. Um, last year, we issued over 1,500 vouchers to families that are under the 200% poverty guideline. We're gonna continue to do that. We have the TANF funds. We're working with a local school to do kind of a drive-through outdoor pickup of vouchers so we don't have crowds coming into any physical location. So I'll definitely um, update you on that, but we do still want to um, make those vouchers available to families. While it's not a significant amount of money, it does help with purchases of, you know, shoes and some items for returning back to school. So we're going to continue that effort this year, but just in an outdoor issuance kind of capacity. That's all I had on that memo. Um, and definitely we'll change the language to put re required and look forward to getting that language um, from Eugene and we'll go forward with that. And then the next is a memo about a contract, contract terminations to and an amendment. So with family and community services, we currently have three support service contracts. One is called intensive intervention. The other is peaceful, safer solutions. And the third is Parenting Towards Solutions. Um, in total, those three contracts cost about $81,000 a year. Um, we, you all supported us terminating a contract called um, MST Multi, what is it? MST Multisystemic Therapy. Multisystemic Therapy. We terminated that contract. The latter part of last year was about $125,000 contract. Um, and so all of these provide some um, similar type of support services that has a mental health counseling connection to them. And so we brainstorm with family and community services on ways we could just provide these services from one contract and not have all these multiple that, you know, have, you know, some similarities. And so Mark Frizone and three or four of his team members and myself and four or five of mine um, had a, several meetings and we all collectively agreed to merging these into one contract with a rename of the REACH program. Um, that contract, they believe that they could provide services to approximately 40 families for under $50,000 a month. And while, why that is, is because most of the services can now be billed through Medicaid, which would not impact our operating budget. So um, if you all support this merging of three to one and this reduction from 81,000 to 50 or below, we will send out notices on two of the contracts to family and community with our intention to terminate those contracts within 30 days. 
And then you will also see in the next week or so the new contract in its final form um, for review. And we could talk about um, those services in depth. So again, Mr. Frizone is aware, um, is supportive. Um, we're trying to streamline and save money at the same time. So um, that's great. That's yeah. that. Good job. Definitely. Okay. All right, then moving on to the um, children's services budget. And after that, if I could just for have two questions or, of you after this budget um, presentation, in addition to the resolution. So when we met with you coming over, Sue? I can't okay, just come to the side. <laughs> we'll sit, I don't when yeah. we were at the last um, meeting, I believe it was last or the meeting before that, we presented our strategies to you. Um, for cost reductions in children's services. And those strategies correlated to $410,000. Um, these budgets for all of our divisions are uploaded into MUNIS. But what Sue did was created this budget um, with the help and support of a state, a retired state fiscal person, just to bring some reality to it and to illustrate to you how our monies come in, how they don't come in uniformly, um, that one month we might get reimbursement of 200,000 and the next month we could potentially get over a million because that's the month that we're entitled to tax dollars or you know from the auditor. So we don't get dollars coming in routinely based on how the state has us set up. So I'm gonna let Sue explain to you what she did with this budget. Um, we can't, we met with you February, I think on this issue. So she started, or April we did, March or April, I don't know, she can explain it to you, but she started with that point in time from a cash balance and move forward. Um, what this budget is based on is, I'm just illustrating this to you now, is that $410,000 that we've, um, put into play with strategies to reduce expenditures from December on. And since my meeting with you, we've also identified $209,000 more in cost savings. So for a total cost savings in this budget of $620,886,009. Wow. Um, Great, but well, the sad part about this is we thought that, um, do you, if you can recall, we talked about us being a Protect Ohio County and that we were at a $500,000 deficit at the end of the year because of the loss of being a Protect Ohio Waiver County. The county of the state had told us that we would be, we would have some kind of a makeup for the loss of those funds in a gap fund. Um, we just learned within the last three weeks that that gap funding is not even going to be available to us until January of 2021. Mm -hmm. So the hole was never filled for us from the state. Um, the hole is represented in this budget for a little less than a million dollars less in funds. So despite the one million dollar less in funds from Protect Ohio um, not receiving the gap funding, we were able to come out from a projected budget at a plus of $180,000. But let me say this to you, that number is gonna only be contingent if the placement costs and the kids in care can stay in some type of a normal state. Um, she based the numbers around about 200 children in foster care and six children in residential facilities. So it'll ebb and flow um, but we will bring this budget back to you in September with real numbers through August. Um, and, and the reality is if residential costs don't decrease and we definitely can't ever sacrifice children or safety and risk, um, there is a chance that I would have to come before the board and ask for financial support on placement costs. Um, the Placement costs associated with um, kids that are remanded in our care from the courts last year were a million dollars um, of our $300 million placement costs. And we do not get a uh, contribution um, from the courts regarding that, um, regarding those kiddos. So 
Um, we've been carrying a $3 million average um, cost on placements for quite some time. And so we've exhausted every strategy outside of laying off staff that we could find to come up with that $620,000 cost savings. And it is my sincere hope that we don't have increased numbers over the next three months and that we can strategize. Um, our social workers are effective in doing everything they can to step kids out of these residential placements as soon as they're able to, meaning they no longer need those services. But the hard and fast reality is, as you know, even with the opioid epidemic is we can't control what goes on in families and we can't control you know, the number of kids that come into our custody via family court either. Um, we can only try to work on creative solutions in tandem with the courts and also um, wraparound services for kids that maybe we don't need to place them in residential initially, that we work more intimately with families and residential facilities are the last resort options. But those things are, you know, ultimately not always in our control. So. I'm just projecting the worst case scenario when we come back in September. My prayer and hope is the best case scenario as we continue to be efficient and we continue to be creative and we, we don't come to you with an emergent need. We don't want to get to a place where we have been at the latter part of years that we're spinning um, and waiting for state dollars that are promised with no dollar amounts tied to them. I mean, that's where we've been really hopeful over the last year. I and mean, there's been new money, but the new monies are often reimbursements and not allocations. So you have to bill for services to get those monies back or pay for services before you get those monies back. And so that's the stinky part of how the state works that we don't get an allocation up front like other places do. So anyways, I'll shut up, but I would like to defer to Sue. She can give you a little bit of background and if you have any questions, but you would get this again um, in September with actuals up through August, then when it's represented. So I'm gonna, you wanna sit here and I'll move over. All right, well, it's pretty simple what we tried to do. Um, so the line that you see where it says cash balance as of April 30th, everything above that had already happened. So I just put in there exactly the expenses and um, uh, revenues or deposits that we had. Everything going forward um, was a estimate. Um, it shouldn't say everything. There are some things that we know ahead of time how much we're gonna get back um, and some things that we don't. Pardon me, I got a call. <coughs> okay, um, so what I tried to do was under the deposits, I put the things that I know, This what the state is really good at is um, when they do reimburse us, they've offset it so that we are always getting something every month. So that's good that they don't, you know, front load us or back load us, but um, it is always different monthly depending on, you know, what month it is, what we're getting back. So I tried in the deposits to break down everything that I knew we were getting and the, and the amounts that we were getting. And then in the expenses, we budgeted um, for the, the money that has to go back to public assistance for all the group home expenses, adoption, foster, um, payroll that comes out, um, and then our average monthly placement costs and our average monthly contract expenses, um, along with just a $20,000 placeholder in there for any miscellaneous expenses. So for daycares or reimbursements to families or whatever that may be. And then in within each month, all I did was take the deposits that are expected, subtracted the expenses off and showed the, the negative or positive for each month. Um, we also put in, um, paying for the remainder of our 2019 contracts. So those are in there as well. And then um, the bottom line, the total is just starting with the cash balance as of April 30th, subtracting or adding each month as we go. Um, we're still um, projected to have 180,000 left over um, or over expenses. Um, what the hard thing is, is to do is, is to really project ahead of time because a lot of times 
our, well, I shouldn't say a lot of times, our expenses are based on, or our reimbursements are based on our expenses. So depending on what you pay, he's going to, your, your reimbursement's going to reflect that. So I tried as best I could to um, look back in history and see what it looked like um, for our 4E reimbursement, which is the reimbursement on, on here, it says SACWIS reimbursement. Um, but we only have, um, we've only been getting that since last October. So um, it's just best guess right now. Um, so we're hoping that our reimbursements will go up. We're hoping that our expenses will go down and that we'll be even in a better situation at the end. Um, we do only have, like Kelly Joe said, one allocation that's advanced. All of our other allocations are reimburse, reimbursements. So we do get every January and then quarterly after that, um, our, our state child protective allocation advanced for like 353,000, I think is what it is. Um, so we're, we rely on the reimbursement um, for everything else. And then like Kelly Joe said too, our gap funding we were originally, I'm not going to say we were led to believe, but the way it was explained to us, there was going to be gap funding for the Protect Ohio counties for that gap where we are, we lost out on Protect Ohio and we weren't yet able to, um, to chart or to bill the federal government for 4E reimbursement. Um, now it's sort of with, like we just found out um, we're not going to actually get it until January of 2021. And then they're not real sure, or they're not real clear, I guess I should say, on the use of it. So whether we'll be able to recode past expenses to it so that, you know, that would be the best case scenario for us if we've already paid something that we could code something we've already paid to it or whether it'll be future expenses that we use it for. And they really haven't clarified whether it'll be an advance or a reimbursement either. So those things are sort of up in the air and exactly how much it will be. It will depend on, um, you know, how the year rolls out, um, in what claims we would have had the old way as opposed to the new way. So anybody have any questions? So Sue, I, I have a question. Are we okay. all caught up on 2000, 2019 bills? Are all but up? the, go ahead. Go ahead, no, I didn't know if you needed me to repeat or if I broke up. Oh, nope, I got, you are breaking up a little but I think I heard it all, yes. We will be as soon as it, as July as we, July hits, and that is built into um, the July expenses budget on here. Okay. And, and and so you know, those are correlation to not receiving invoices in 2019. Those invoices came to us in 2020. So everything that we received in 2019. Uh -huh. um, has been paid, but anything that came in 2020 from providers um, multiple months at a time with needing to get collateral information, those are the ones that are have been outstanding and Sue's been working with an agency or two to um, get the backup information needed to be able to pay those. Okay. Quick question, Sue. Sure. Maybe you don't have the number off the top of your head, but. You're reporting 89,000 in cash effective April 30th. Mm -hmm. You know what that was April 30th of 2019? I do not, but I can get that amount to you okay. easy enough. You're just looking what we're trending. You know. Yep, yep, absolutely. Okay. I'll send Thank that you. to you. And Sue, how does the 184 projection compare to year end 2019? I believe that at year end 2019, gosh, I know we were less than $100,000. I want to say right around 50 or $60,000, if I remember right. And again, we just have implemented a half a million dollars in savings for the first half of 2020. And then again, the other 220 will be the remainder of 2020. So those didn't, would not have factored into. 2019 versus 2020. Does that make sense? I probably confused. <laughs> At the end of 2019, we did not have the cost saving measures in place. We did that starting December. So the $690,000 that we've realized in our works and strategies are reflective in 2020 only. So again, we ended and presented to you at the end of year that we were 
at a loss relevant to protect Ohio of $500,000. So again, reflecting back on that, when Protect Ohio stopped October 31st, September, September 30th, 30th yeah. um, we had to realize a half a million dollar deficit for the last quarter of 2019. Oh, and a million for 2020 or? I'm sorry, I didn't hear I have, you. I have that we're losing a million in Protect Ohio. In 2020, right. the loss is a million dollars because absolutely. So projecting ahead, but at the end of 2019, by December 31st, we were less $500,000. So we were at a deficit then. Now projecting ahead in 2020, that loss is a million dollars over 12 months. Um, then again, we found some cost savings of about 690,000. So a little bit more in balance um, at the end of this year, but we also haven't replaced a number of positions and stuff too, so. And that Protect Ohio amount, that Protect Ohio um, deficit was based on the fact that we hadn't started receiving our 4E reimbursement yet again. So there was a gap. So as of September 30th, those services were covered, September 30th and prior were covered by Protect Ohio. Starting October 1st, then we pay those and then we get federal reimbursement at the 62, whatever percentage it is for the FMAP. So um, we, we had to start paying October's invoice before we could get any reimbursement for it. So October, we weren't even able to pay probably until January. So there was that three month lag where we weren't getting any reimbursement because of the lag in the, um, the service period, let's put it that way. So does that mean it's not really a million dollars total loss that there's won. reimbursement for a piece of it? Correct. So the, the, we, we estimated a million just because we had lost out on 500,000 in six months. So we were estimating that to know exactly how much we'll be, we'll have lost. We'd obviously have to wait until the year's over and then see what we would have gotten in. And that's sort of what they're going to do at the state with the gap money. They're going to look and see what we would have received as Protect Ohio counties as a whole, like for the whole, all 20 of us or 19 of us, however many there are. And then they're going to look and see how much we received the traditional reimbursement way through federal 4E dollars. And then they're, they're, they've got a little formula and they're going to give us that funding if we actually received less than what we would have under Protect Ohio. But the sad reality is, you know, there, there was no provisions for counties that had to make up that deficit, that are making up that deficit, other than reduce budgets, which we've done. Um, and, and so, again, not every county, there are counties that have levies and are supported by the Commissioner's General Fund dollars for placement costs. Um, there are counties that have no levies, so in Portage, of course, we do have a levy. Um, we've not come before the commissioners and asked for you all to support placement costs um, since I've been a director and hope that that not be the case. But um, definitely there's several counties in Protect Ohio that get funding from you know, all sources. So their deficits um, have been made up through county commissioner general fund dollars too. So again, that's not where we're at, but that was the purpose when we presented last year and us doing this more detailed budget versus what's in Munis for you to see the dollars that do come in when they come in. We've also wanted you to see what we've done as far as our best efforts in reducing our costs. We're very blessed to have passed both of our levies. Um, and so the, again, come September, we can, if we can control numbers, it would be perfect. We would come out in a good place despite not having the gap funding. But if more kids come in care than we're projecting, and again, we can't control these residential numbers outside, you know, as far as kids being remanded, um, that can cause us to have a crisis. We do not want to wait to the last minute. Um, and so again, we have a meeting with um, Judge Berger and his team and our prosecutors um, in a week and a half. We have a number of creative ideas the multi-system youth funds that are available through Family and Children's First Council, which I'm a chair of, 
Um, we are not utilizing those funds like we should in Portage. We've had zero applications. The only way we can utilize those dollars if the kids are not in our custody. So again, gonna have some conversations. The court is an independent body and the judge will do what he feels necessary in his courtroom. But if parents can retain custody of their children and us still be able to work with them and still utilize residential facilities if needed, those dollars don't have to come from this operating budget. It can come from the state of Ohio. So our hope in our meeting with a team of eight of us is to be able to come to some kind of an agreement or an understanding of how best to utilize these funds. Summit County, I know a, a month or two ago, Children's Services had had 11 of these um, applications approved. Again, that offsets costs. You can have a family that's open um, and, and have the state pay for some of these residentials versus we have to be the, the custodial parent and lose out on that opportunity. So I can keep you all abreast or at least um, Kathleen, I know as a president, I can update you from the meeting if you want, but definitely at the next one, let you know what we're able to accomplish. But it's um, really essential that we um, share all of these things with the court. Again, respectfully, we have no control over the judge um, and, and what he feels is in the best interest of kids and when he involves us and when he doesn't. But, um, and it's not about money. I don't want people to think we would ever sacrifice safety because of dollars, but I would be remiss in not reporting to you that placement costs in residential facilities were, you know, just most recently we had a, um, a am I still on? We had a, a provider that, you know, wanted to charge us $500 a day for a child. Um, we have to be um, very cognizant and assess really critically what these kids are getting at these facilities to commit to us wanting to engage in these contracts. Um, and unfortunately for me as the director, I have to balance between what's in the best interest of kids and safety and the financial implications too. And it's, it's not a fun task at all. Um, and so again, hopefully we can do some creative things with the courts and at least offset some of those costs. So. Um, just wanted to share that with you, and we're trying really hard. I know my system very well, um, but definitely cannot control those certain things. So anyways, I'm on a soapbox. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Jo, I just want to say I think you do an outstanding job. I respect you so much and the role that you have. You're very compassionate, have a lot of empathy, and you're right. You try to balance the finance with the welfare of the children, and I have faith that you will never undermine the children because of finance however you're trying your best to make that yeah. balance thank you I, I really appreciate that i lose a lot of sleep at night uh, over money and i know and, you. and then coupled with tragedies with kids but uh, sue sue is very well respected in the fiscal world in jfs and we're opening ourselves up there's nothing to hide we cannot control the number of kids in care but we can only do our best to reunite sooner and not place children at risk. So uh, we're committed to coming quarterly to you on these updates now that we have this, you know, tailor-made kind of budget outside of Munis and pre present to you whatever you need to know. Um, I've tried really hard to not have to come to the commissioners for any kind of financial asks. And I would hope we would never have to do that, but the reality is, the reality is. So I appreciate you saying that um, very much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And Sue does an outstanding job. And you work very Thank well you. together. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. you. Kelly Jo. Yes, ma'am. Are we realizing any savings from having the group home? I know we, it looks like we had five kids in there. Is yep. that helping us at all? I mean, are we to that point? Yep. Um, Sue has projected uh, $125,000 savings for the year, um, and that we based on five kids or six? Ooh, I think it was six. Six kids. Um, we okay. have the capacity to take in eight, but we have seen savings, especially um, regarding them stepping down from residential facilities again, where they're charging us $300, $400 a day, stepping down into yeah. um, the group home. We're not having to pay that. And um, we are able to seek reimbursement for the kids in the group home. So absolutely, um, it is 
allowing okay. us to see savings. Okay. So Kelly, so is yeah. why you to come to us today then for um, an advance on the taxes? I didn't hear. Is that why you're coming? Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, Just because we would get it in the latter part of July, but getting it earlier is best for us okay, because then we can start the taxes on the proceeds. And we did it last year too. So the, unfortunately the auditor knows we do this frequently. So it just helps us to have the money sooner in the month rather than later. So Sue had that resolution to present to you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Request for the county auditor to advance taxes from the proceeds of the 2020 tax collection year pursuant to section 321 uh, three four of the Ohio Revised Code to Portage County Job and Family Services. Okay, I will second. Roll call, Amy. Vicki. Yes. Sabrina. Yes. Yes. Can I just ask? Bring oh, up right. one more questions. item. Um, so again, I intend to send out to all of my. Um, JFS team bargaining and non-bargaining about the hiring freeze. And then um, I'll be sending out other correspondence regarding some other cost saving measures that we're gonna employ. But um, we did prior to the commissioners adopting hiring freeze resolution, um, post an interview for the MIS coordinator who is our IT specialist, David Moore. He went on to a school district. Mm -hmm. um, I. We have, um, we had second interviews. Sue and Brian Boykin interviewed two candidates a second time last week. I would ask though, if the commissioners could consider allowing us to hire that position. It's critical now that we're teleworking um, and it's critical if there's some modifications made from JFS IT. So I don't know if you would want to speak to your decision on that now, but um, that was in play before of all these changes. So. I, I don't know if you have any questions, but I'm hoping that you could consider allowing me filling that position. Yeah, I, I think it's like, as you stated, it's essential with the teleworking and it's something that I don't think is gonna go away anytime soon and probably will become part of it. Oh. <coughs> is that okay? Do I need to get a vote for something like that? That again, I, we I haven't offered a position that yet. Being consensual and wanting to replace that. Oh, no. Sue, I didn't get Rena, that. What did you say? Cut out a little bit. Could you say that again? Oh, nothing other than I support that because I can understand essential, especially with the teleworking. And teleworking is not going to probably go away anytime soon and probably will be part of our new way of doing things right. yeah well again as i stated to randy we normally do go with the director's recommendation i think that makes sense uh as well i think we should try to come up with a standardized kind of couple of questions about hiring decisions uh going forward just for directors to think through uh, whether the hire uh, is absolutely necessary or not. And maybe Jean, that's something that you could work with Janet on uh, in lieu of having that ready, um, this hire uh, seems that it would fall into whatever uh, those questions that we come up with would be, I mean, a, a, as many staff of you as you have, the IT help desk uh, numbers that you present, it, it just seems like um, an essential hire. So I, I join the other two and say uh, that that makes sense. And then hopefully, Jean, we could standardize that a little bit uh, going forward as we face these hiring decisions. I only, I'm in total agreement with that. And I only have one question. Is there just one person in your organization that's IT? No, we have three actually. Um, okay. Again, but we have four program areas and 200 employees. So they're working on four different eligibility Platforms. systems. 
right. and we we follow the state guidelines. So yeah, so it's a pretty robust. That's uh, what I was. That's where I was headed, and you just yeah. answered the question. This is almost state mandated. Yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. again, the skill set necessary is what we need. We need somebody that has um, intimate knowledge on IT and networking issues and be able to communicate with state IT. And the two support staff we have, while they do an excellent job, um, don't provide the skill sets um, for this position. So to carry it. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's all we had on your agenda. Is that right? Thank Kelly you Jones? so much. Yep, that was it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, right. guys. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Thanks to both of you. Bye. Take care. All right, Jean. Did you have anything else? Did we finish? I snuck the one in at the miscellaneous, which was going door to door talking to people about masks, and that's what I have. Yeah. Okay. Wear your mask. While you're doing it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Do we have anything else? Uh, it was just asking, that we need to... I'd just like to make a comment about Gene and his short time. You've really come in and you've you've hit the road running and it's been a very helpful. Thank you. Oh, well, that's really a testament to the people that I work with, not to me. You know, well, everybody's been player. very helpful. So yes. Thanks, team. Thank you. Are we ready to adjourn? Yes. So moved. I'll second. Roll call, Amy. Vicki? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Sabrina? Yes. All right. Thank you. Everyone have a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye.